basically it's in the lateral border of the medial femoral condyle and it's got quite a big footprint. So from talking to a couple of my bosses, uh, there was the argument for the double bundle versus single bundle technique is that a single bundle doesn't actually take up the whole footprint for the posterior crucial ligament, which is where there was some argument um, for double bundle uh, reconstruction. It goes back to uh, just under the posterior rim of the tibia uh, in that posterior sulcus. And again, it's got two bundles, uh, the anterior lateral and the posterior medial, in contrast to the um, anterior crucial ligament, which obviously has AM and PL bundles. Um, and this is just how my brain works, but the posterior crucial ligament, if you look at the tibial plateau, it's the most posterior structure, isn't it? Um, so the guide to actions and uh, the biomechanics. The PCL essentially stops the femur sliding forward off the tibial plateau. And according to LARC, it's the only stabilising factor in a weight bearing flex, flex knee, which is pretty important when you're walking downstairs. Um, it resists 80 to 100% of the posteriorly directed knee force, um, especially at 30 and 90 degrees of uh, flexion. But then also the secondary stabilisers, which are your posterolateral fauna, uh, and your lateral lateral ligament are very um, so the mechanisms uh, of injury, classically it's like a dashboard uh, type injury. So if you think of like your motor vehicle accident, quite on quite often the injury is bilateral. So uh, or like a skier, there's been a couple um, who I've purchased friends of mine who have landed, I've uh, been on the skis and landed on both knees and blown both their PCLs, which has ramifications for when you're examining them, which I'll talk about later. Um, other mechanisms of injury are hyperextension. Um, and then there's, there's been described as a whole sort of rotor thing, so rotatory uh, components and then so, uh, various forces as well have been described as posterior crucial ligament. The video is not working, unfortunately. This is uh, Buddy, you can actually hear Lee Nassi uh, last Friday night, so it's the post to appreciate uh, being severely stretched. And I was sitting on the couch during this talk, which, um, and you can see Buddy's knees sort of hyper uh, extending, but apparently he feels okay. It's just about to play. Next year. Um, this is just, just another sort of interesting comment which describes the mechanism injury of PCL. Um, and this is from the AFL uh, Sports and Injury Summary. So since the introduction of the 10 metre ruck rule, so uh, the ruck rule only has you know, a couple of metres to run up rather than these classic uh, run up, the force of collision is a lot less. So the, uh, the incidence and prevalence of PCL injuries uh, in AFL football has actually decreased since the introduction of that uh, 10 metre rule, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, so moving a bit on to classification, uh, Shelbourne uh, wrote this paper in 1999 which described about 150 PCL injuries. It's probably the best one uh, to read the reference coming up. But importantly, uh, this classification, grades 1, 2 and 3, uh, is of the uh, amount of tibial translation in comparison to the contralateral knee. And given there's quite a number of uh, bilaterals, the classification doesn't really work for someone with, for example, bilateral uh, dashboard injury. So we've always got to make sure that you um, compare it to the other knee which is not injured. Um, so symptoms patients uh, tend to remember the they have difficulty weight bearing, particularly on a uh, flex knee, <coughs> they have difficulty walking downstairs, complain of instability and oddly enough complain of um, anterior knee pain. I'm not sure if that's really experience. Um, so specifically for PCL, there's a couple of tests that are for isolated posterior cruciate ligament injuries and then looking at combined posterior cruciate and posterior lateral corner. Um, the, you always need to check all ligaments for instability because isolated PCL injuries are actually pretty rare. Um, the posterior draw test, you need to make sure that you've got uh, the correct starting placements. I don't do what I did uh, the other day and hit the ACL for a PCL because I didn't get the tibia back up to where it, uh, where it should be. Um, and then the second one is the posterior sag test. So normally the medial tibial plateau is a centimetre anterior to the femoral condyle. Um, and so if you can feel a step, uh, then that's a, a positive posterior sag test. One to add to that is the quads axis test. So as soon as your patient tends to the quads, you get them in 90 degrees, get them to push their foot back. 
um, the tibia comes back up to the uh, natural position, or its, its unsubluxed position. Um, and this is meant to be a video of the, um, the quadductive test, but uh, you can see that um, the stag there, and it's about to the quad to the tibia plus forward. Um, so these tests are a, a test for combined posterior uh, crucial ligament and posterior lateral corner uh, injury. Um, and basically the one that I've seen used most clinically uh, is the dial test. And so at 30 degrees um, of flexion, if the posterior lateral corner is gone, you'll have an increased rotation compared to the other side. However, at 90 degrees, an impact PCL takes over doesn't increase further. If you have both posterior lateral corner and piece, then uh, it's open both at 30 and at 90 degrees. Um, so essentially how I put it in my head is that if you just have an isolated PCL injury, you're going to have problems in an AP plane on examination and if you combine mm -hmm. it with a posterior lateral corner, um, then that's when the test for rotation um, also can come in. So again, the, this is the, the best paper to read is this one by Shelvin that described the, the natural history. Um, these other people, uh, these other guys looked at sort of between about t uh, 20 and 30 uh, isolated, non-operatively managed posterior cruciate ligament injuries. And they essentially found about half of people make it back to sport at the same level that they were playing before their PC. That's all treated uh, non-operatively. There is an absence of long-term data in the, the literature. We don't know what happens at 10, 15. Um, so how I would manage an isolated PCL injury at the moment is um, <coughs> some non-operative treatment first, um, so bracing, squats, modification, and physio, and quad strengthening is probably the most important, as emphasised by the quad test. Um, and then uh, Hana looked at about 20 uh, <coughs> PCL injuries and reported they got back to the board. Uh, so moving on to indications after surgery, it's exactly what um, Matt says. So you look at acute combined ligament injury, that later on, um, acute displaced bony avulsions, and then symptomatic chronic uh, high grade tears. So that's just some cool pictures to make sure that you're awake. Um, acute, uh, mm, um, acute uh, bony avulsions, the same uh, techniques described to fix them both open and arthroscopically. Um, what I found is there wasn't actually a definition of displacement. The articles just said uh, displaced. So it's not like it was five millimetres or more than ten millimetres. What I could get was just you fix them for displacement. For undisplaced, then you, you leave them alone and let them heal up on their own. Um, from talking to it to my bosses, there's a, a couple of pretty senior surgeons down at Frank. And uh, the comment was, uh, why do we have to fix them microscopically? There's, there's a lot of um, a lot of bundles, uh, a lot of neurovascular bundles near the PCL that would make me nervous. So um, the data for open repair and arthroscopic is actually pretty similar. These guys uh, reported 42 patients um, treated operatively and strongly recommended early uh, fixation within three weeks. And if you leave them too long, they don't do as well. <coughs> Um, moving on to symptomatic chronic high grade tears, uh, the indication of surgery greater than 10 degrees increased posterior translation and greater than 15 degrees external rotation in comparison to the other side um, in a patient who is symptomatic. Um, multiple techniques, unfortunately, it didn't, didn't come out but there's multiple techniques. So there's the transtibial, uh, which uh, is used generally by the guys uh, around town in Melbourne, uh, and then the tibial inlay technique. Um, in, in the literature, the only uh, criticism of the transtibial approach is that this uh, goes around a, a 90 degree bend and it's described as a, a pillar two. There's a little bit of uh, cadaver data supporting uh, graft failure um, in, in this technique. That certainly hasn't been correlated clinically. Um, so basically, in terms of uh, outcomes, the Norwegian, uh, the Norwegian guys have a national cruciate uh, registry and they looked at 51 uh, isolated PCL injuries. Um, they all trialled non-operative treatment for about six months. 
and I had a follow up with those 41 patients for about four years, and they all had pretty good results uh, post operatively, with about 60 to 70 percent returning health, and all of them reporting an improvement in symptoms. However, none of them reported their needs as good as what it was pre-injury, so they still had some some pain and residual. Um, in terms of uh, comparing the techniques, um, comparing and then particularly looking at single and double bundle reconstruction. Um, uh, Kim uh, from 2009 found some biomechanical uh, evidence for double bundle technique, but this couldn't be correlated uh, clinically. Um, and patients were generally the same across the board. Um, so in summary, basically, um, same as that. So if they isolated PCL injuries, you initially manage them uh, non operatively regardless of grace, um, and then you consider reconstruction for chronic instability, uh, and again a low threshold for aura uh, in displaced avulsion fractures. And I guess the big question is, is Buddy going to make it this weekend? So that's not working. Thank you.